I'm very pleased to be joined here in the interview area by Fabiano Caruana. He's just defeated Nijat Abasov in the second game of the match, forcing tomorrow's tiebreak. Fabiano, first of all, congratulations on the win. Before we talk about today's game, I really have to ask you about yesterday's game. You were playing okay, you were defending well, and then this queen before. What happened there, Fabiano, yesterday? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm actually completely exhausted. I, I don't know what else to say. I'm like the last few days have been, have been tough. Uh, I mean, the tournament was long and uh, the tiebreak against Prague was, was difficult. And uh, losing that, then I, I mean, even before that, I already felt tired. But after that match, I really felt completely exhausted. And I didn't know exactly how it would affect me. Uh, but yesterday was, was a complete uh, disgrace of a game, of course. I mean, it, it wasn't even that like one particular mistake, but just I, I, I don't even know what I was thinking the whole game. I was like sitting at the board looking at the pieces and and I'm not even sure what I was calculating the entire time. It was like complete confusion. Just uh, my head wasn't working at all. Um, I mean, okay, to his credit, he put pressure on me. He played he played a good, good game, but uh, I just wasn't there. And uh, I mean, at least I managed to come back, but I have to say, I, okay, I think it, it's the same for everyone probably. Everyone's kind of exhausted. You mm -hmm. saw Magnus even said that he's sick and exhausted. And uh, I guess everyone is uh, is feeling it to, to some degree. It's It's been a really long tournament. And to be honest, I, I haven't even had the toughest path. Let's say I didn't play as many tie breaks as, for example, Nija did uh, or, or Prague did. Um, but yeah, that's uh, the, the level of play, I think, can be explained by, by your tiredness. So you lose yesterday, probably didn't have a good night, but you still had to try and come back today with the white pieces. And uh, he went, instead of going for the Shreznikov, he went for this bishop b4 line and you chose the tricky queen f3. It seemed to us that you sort of caught him in, in the opening, or at least he didn't fully understand all the, the lines or the complexity of the line. Is that, was that your sensation during the game? Yeah, I, I caught him. I, I kind of predicted he would go for this because he's been playing another variation throughout the tournament, allowing the Rosalimo, for example, against Magnus, um, against uh, Vidit, and, and several other games against Peter. So so many times he was allowing the, the Sveshnikov, but in the past he's played this line. And I thought he wouldn't want to get the sort of fight that we would have in the Sveshnikov, uh, sorry, not the Sveshnikov, the Rosalimo, uh, where it's kind of a long game. We, we both... No, you know, like white doesn't get much of an edge usually, but but you get a really tough fight. While here, black is just trying to kill the game off with the four knights, and mm. and there's a lot of theory behind it. So I prepared a, a surprise, which worked out perfectly. Uh, he he didn't know this this very rare long castle, I guess. Uh, usually, white gives a check, um, and and takes the rook, and there's some theory there. But yeah, this long castle, it's it's very dangerous. It's for both sides. I mean, it's kind of a crazy position. Uh, queen e7 is a mistake. Um, after that, it's it's a pretty bad position. Although I have to say, it was very very tough to to win this end game. I don't know. I probably made some mistakes in it. Uh, maybe bishop b5 was questionable. Uh, I, I felt like bishop b5. I kind of probably should have done something else. Um, but in any case, I, I was probably better throughout the entire game. Uh, yeah, queen e7 was a mistake. But I I don't think you can fault him for for this mistake because it's such a difficult position. I mean, black should either play e5 or g5 or rook b8. They're like three decent moves. And queen e7, the funny thing is that like this c4, uh, queen f6, c3 was played in a game uh, between like under 14 girls mm -hmm. a long time ago. Uh, and white played a perfect game, like absolutely perfect, immaculate game. Uh, so that, that was, um, so we were following this very obscure game and he deviated with g5. I didn't know like what, um, I was kind of torn between bishop d6, which is the obvious move, and cd5 was kind of tempting, but cd5 seemed too complicated to figure out. So I, okay, I went for that endgame. Um, f3 I wasn't 100% sure about, but I felt like it's the right move to restrict his knight. And um, yeah, then bishop b5 was maybe not the right decision, because then I thought that he could get the same position. Like he, I thought maybe this dc3 was a big mistake. He can play bishop to e6, or bishop f5, he gets a position with two pawns versus one pawn on the queen side, I have an exchange up. He has the bishop, which stays, let's say, on e6. I think I think it's very difficult to win this. And after dc3, I feel like it's winning. He probably um, underestimated bishop a4, although I could be wrong, of course. That's a question we were um, more or less trying to analyze or understand. 
And even in the commentator's booth, they were um, not confused, but they were, they asked me to, to, to ask you this question. When you dropped the A2 pawn, instead of playing the other line, which was A3, were you confident the end game was winning? Did you know about any previous example or was it just a hunch that you'd win that end game? Uh, I felt like with the pawn on g5, he, he has a weakness. Uh, okay, without rooks, it's, it's completely winning, for sure. Uh, with rooks, it's pretty difficult, but I did feel like I have a hook to attack on the g5 pawn. And I considered a3 for a while, but then I thought, um, okay, he'll put his bishop on d5. So that's why rook c3 also stops bishop d5. Then I'll, I'll probably, um, before taking on c3, I'll probably throw in rook d8. Because if I take, then maybe he gets more counterplay. My rook on d6 is terribly played, so I have to put it on d8. He plays rook b7, rook c3, because otherwise he gets a lot of counterplay with rook b2. Mm -hmm. And then he plays rook b5. I think it's very important. I attack the pawn, let's say rook a8, and he plays rook a5. And I can't dislodge the rook from a5. Uh, so I, And his bishop on d5 is also very strong. So I wasn't sure. And then if I play rook b8, he always plays rook b5. And he's happy to trade rooks on b5 and get the, a, b, the b5, c6 mm -hmm. structure. So I thought with the rook on a5, like I don't really have very good constructive ideas and my only target is the a pawn if i can't get to that pawn then i just can't win i mean i have no other ideas so i considered that for a bit i thought if he doesn't have rook a5 like maybe i would have gone for it because uh, without the rook on a5 i think uh i probably win the a pawn mm -hmm. like I, I didn't see another way for him to hold this position uh, but after i saw that i just i considered it a bit i didn't see a way through i was thinking yeah maybe i can try to get my other rook in but then he starts giving checks if my king is very vulnerable so, so that's why I rejected that. And then you had the hunch that the other end game was probably winning or maybe 70%. What, what were you thinking? I didn't really put it in percentages. I thought that uh, my chances of winning are very good and I wasn't 100% sure. But uh, w once I got my king to the king side, I was quite happy because I, I actually thought he needed to try to prevent me from once the king's on f2. It's like, yeah, just slowly I'm preparing h4. Um, maybe he could have tried to get his pawn to h4, but I also have f4 and like somehow, I mean, he just waited. That was, that's a strategy as well, but it, it didn't work out because I eventually managed to get this h4 in. The g pawn becomes very weak. Okay. Putting the bishop on g6 is probably a mistake. I guess he should keep the bishop on e6. I guess that's, that's more tenacious. I was kind of happy when he put the bishop on g6. So of course you're exhausted. Abasov is probably also exhausted. You have the momentum now because you won the second game. But tomorrow you have a really tough um, tie break with Abasov. Two questions. What are you going to do to prepare this uh, tie break? And uh, how do you think the matchup he did eliminate uh, Gidi in the tie break? What do you think of him as a tie break player? No, I, I think it's going to be very tough. I mean, not only did he beat Danish, but also he beat Peter. Um, he beat Fresnay in the second round. So, yeah, he's won a number of tie breaks. Um, I mean, He's, he's playing well. Even today, I don't think he played a bad game or anything. It's just opening didn't work out. And um, yeah, in terms of preparing for the tiebreak, I'm going to try to rest as much as possible. That's the main thing for me. Fabiana Caruana, won today's game, forces the tiebreak, and tomorrow we'll have a really exciting end of tournament with Fabiano and Abbasov playing for the third, fourth place. And of course, the main match between Carlson and Prague in the tiebreak tomorrow. Thanks a lot. And I think there's still some other media who want to ask you a few questions. Thank you. Cheers.